and welcome to our internal medicine uh, grand rounds uh, here at University of Louisville. And we are pleased this morning to have uh, a, a world-renowned authority in uh, the area of uh, CART cell therapy. And this is our uh, annual YAM lecture. Uh, we were blessed to have our uh, internationally known hematology and oncology specialist, Dr. Yam, who passed away in May of 2013. Uh, he was, uh, after an extended illness, he was a prolific researcher and authority on blood disease and diagnostic biomarkers. Uh, Dr. Yam's research and seminal studies helped establish uh, tests for hairy cell leukemia and other blood disorders and cancers. He published over 190 manuscripts, many of which have become classics. Although he had uh, really many, many, many medical achievements throughout his career, he, he was really most fondly remembered for not only guiding medical students and assistants to become successful in medicine, uh, but also he was known for his gentle, confident way with patients uh, and their families. Uh, Lung Yam was born in Canton, China in 1936. He received his medical degree from National Taiwan University in 1961 and, and served his internship um, at Cook County Hospital and residency at Mount Sinai Hospital in Chicago. He did his fellowship training at New England Medical Center in Boston uh, with Dr. Bill Cosby, a giant in American hematology. And after working at the Scripps Clinic and Research Foundation in La Jolla, he moved to University of Louisville in 1974, retiring as professor of medicine from U of L uh, School of Medicine and chief of hematology and the uh, Rex Robley BA uh, Medical Center. Dr. Yam will always be fondly remembered by his colleagues and trainees uh, and patients. And so we're really honored to have um, uh, a wonderful speaker, Dr. Mohammed Karfan Nabaja, uh, uh, who will be uh, giving our Yam lecture this, this uh, morning. And he's going to be introduced by our uh, also world-renowned uh, Dr. Uh, Higazi. Uh, Dr. Higazi is a... Uh, in our, he is our uh, chief in bone marrow transplant uh, oncology and hematology, and he is from the Mansura School of Medicine, uh, did his residency at the Jersey Shore Medical Center, and he's been uh, at University of Louisville since his fellowship. Uh, Dr. Agazi. You're mute, uh, Dr. Hijazi, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, thank <laughs> you for okay. Williams. And um, I just want to share one fun fact as I uh, have the honor to also introduce Dr. Debaji, that um, 14 years ago, uh, I uh, did a presentation as a visiting uh, international student from with Dr. Yam. Uh, I do believe in the summer of 2009, he um, was uh, serving his uh, last few months before he retired uh, in that fall. So um, I, I had the honor to um, uh, spend a month with him and uh, a few words of wisdom that he taught me is still in mind in terms of the field of hematology, oncology, and how he pictures it. Now, today to our uh, world-renowned speaker, Dr. Khirfan Debaje is um, a prolific um, researcher in the field of um, cellular therapy and bone marrow transplant. He is um, the uh, vice chair of the Department of Hematology Oncology at uh, Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. He, uh, previous uh, to that, has served also at the uh, as the uh, faculty at the University at the Moffitt Cancer Center, and um, he has um, hundreds of publications in the field and has guided us over the past over twenty years um, of his experience to uh, new um, uh, realms and areas that we understand better cellular therapy as well as transplant without taking much of his time, because if I continue to talk about his CV and all the committees that he has served on and the, and the national um, bodies that he uh, participated in, we won't have enough time today. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Khirfan Debaje is going to uh, enlighten us today on the CAR T cell therapy in diffuse large cell lymphoma. Welcome, Dr. Debaje. Thank you very much, Dr. Hejazi, and thank you, Dr. Williams, for extending this invitation. Uh, certainly a true honor for me to 
uh, give this Jan Memorial Lecture uh, for the Department of Medicine at the University of Louisville. Uh, I wish I was able to be in person there. Actually, I'm attending on the inpatient bone marrow transplant service. So, and it's springtime here, uh, spring break. So it was difficult to find the coverage, but certainly uh, honored to be with you this morning. And uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm gonna share my slides and hopefully it's showing there well. Can you see my slides clearly? Not yet. Mm -hmm. uh, here we go. All right, perfect, yes. Perfect. So the task before me uh, today is to really show uh, and convince you that, that CAR T cell therapy has redefined the treatment algorithm for relapse and refractory diffuse star T cell lymphoma. I'm gonna be showing a lot of data. I'm gonna try to make it, certainly for the audience, try to make it uh, easy to understand and really appreciate this amazing advancement in the field of uh, treatment of hematologic malignancies. These are my conflicts of interest, which I have provided also in advance. And the way I outline this presentation is first, I'm gonna be focusing on the diffuse RB cell lymphoma, obviously in the amount of time given for this presentation. I'm gonna provide the background that led to the approval of uh, three of the CAR T cell therapies. And this is uh, with the emphasis on beyond second line. And then I'm gonna, look into these two products that got approved uh, for treatment of patients with second line uh, diffuse service cell lymphoma. I'm gonna discuss some of the CAR T cell associated toxicities and really how we become much better in identifying, prognosticating them, and uh, discussing some of the CAR T cell therapy mechanisms of failure and uh, discuss some of the treatment options that we have uh, work together with other colleagues at other centers and living with some take home messages. So I think we're living through a therapeutic revolution that probably dates back to over 25 years ago with the development of monoclonal antibodies for treating various type of cancers. Nowadays, whether it's solid tumor or hematologic malignancies, I cannot think of a regimen that does not include some sort of monoclonal antibody or immunotherapy. So CAR T-cell therapy stands for chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy. And it's really a type of uh, immunotherapy that uses engineered T-lymphocytes to specifically target an intended cancer cell. So I put here side by side uh, this uh, uh, picture showing the normal T-cell and next to it, the CAR T-cell. And we can see here that <clears throat> the marvelous engineering of uh, creating a signaling domain for this cell and an antigen recognition domain, which actually the benefit of that is that it localizes better the tumor. It could be more effective in killing the tumor, but also it can expand and it can persist for longer time. And this is one of the attributes that makes this therapy so effective against uh, this type of, of diseases. This other aspect that is important to emphasize, and I'm, I'm glad to share that uh, we at the Mayo Clinic have built our own CAR T product that uh, we will be probably starting in a clinical trial by the last quarter of this year, uh, looking at a different target than CD19. But the important message here is that all of this started in academic medical centers. Uh, Axicaptagen cellulosal uh, is basically uh, what uh, was developed at the NCI. The group at the University of Pennsylvania developed this at Genleclusel and the group at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle with the University of Washington developed Lysocaptagen maralusel. Now, the other fascinating aspect is that all of these products actually represent just the second generation of CAR T cell therapy. And now there is an, another pipeline of CAR T cell therapies, which probably are gonna make these products eventually look more obsolete. And that's the third generation. And actually we're talking also about the fourth generation of CAR T cell therapies. For those of you who may not be familiar with the procedure, uh, the patients uh, need to undergo a leukophoresis where these cells are collected. Uh, the threshold is that this patient should have an absolute lymphocyte count of more than 100 uh, to be able to go on the machine. Process takes typically five and a half to six hours. And then these cells are uh, transported 
to the manufacturing facility where the turnaround time is typically between 17 days for some companies, sometimes taking up to five weeks for, for other products. Uh, these cells, uh, we get notified that the cells are in-house. The patient undergo lymphodepleting chemotherapy, typically a regimen consisting of fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, three days of that, two days of rest, and then the cells are infused on day zero. And the intended goal is that these cells go find the cancer cells and are able to kill them and recruit other uh, effector cells to kill them. So large vessel lymphoma became an, an area of interest because certainly it's the most common uh, lymphoma in the Western hemisphere with uh, almost a third of the cases being of that particular uh, type. So what is the standard treatment for large vessel lymphoma? Uh, we know that first-line chemoimmunotherapy, typically with an anthracycline-based regimen, uh, what we uh, call for simplicity CHOP plus rituximab, yield successful outcomes in approximately two thirds of the cases. Now we know that high dose uh, chemo chemotherapy and autologous transplantation cures around half of those patients, but those are the patients who have relapsed after CHOP, got treated with second line and have demonstrated chemosensitive uh, disease uh, to be able to, to achieve that 50% cure. And here in red, I uh, cite some data that actually uh, based on, on studies in the past that show that if you were to do an autologous transplant with refractory disease, non-responsive, that these uh, patients have less than 15% probability of being cured with that particular intervention. So autologous transplant became the, the standard of care for patients with relapsed uh, chemosensitive disease based on this uh, study dating back to 1995, known as the PARMA study. This was a multi-center randomized study showing that transplantation was superior to conventional treatments. In these days, rituximab was not approved yet, but the survival, the, the superiority was both in terms of event-free and as well as overall survival showing statistically significant difference favoring the transplant arm. And then more recently in 2010, this is in the era of monoclonal antibodies and rituximab, still uh, the intent of the study was to show whether there is a role for maintenance uh, uh, rituximab, and that was unfortunately not, not shown to be of benefit, but shows that still, even in, in the era of rituximab, we're still able to cure around 50% of those patients uh, who go for an autologous transplant. So let's focus on patients who have uh, failed two or more lines of therapy, which could have included an autologous transplant. And this is a study known as the SCHOLAR-1 study uh, published by Michael Cramp and colleagues. And it looks at four major databases, the MD Anderson Cancer Center, the University of Iowa and the Mayo Clinic Consortium, a database from Canada and the CORAL study from France. And we can see that the probability of attaining a complete remission is somewhere between two and 15%. Now, if you were to pull uh, this data and do a meta-analysis, you would probably get around seven to 8% or less than 10% uh, probability. So if a patient has failed frontline therapy, second line therapy, and goes for a third line therapy with just chemoimmunotherapy, the probability of attaining a complete remission is certainly less than 10%. So this first uh, study known as ZUMA1 uh, with this product known as Axicaptagen Cirolusel was uh, uh, evaluated in the patient with relapsed refractory large B cell lymphoma. Now here are some of the important aspects of the, of the patient population. So the study intended to enroll 111 patients. Unfortunately, 10% of these cases did not make it to the treatment, mostly because this patient died while waiting for the product or simply became ineligible because of worsening comorbidities and other reasons as well. The median age, uh, I would say slightly younger than what you would expect for large visceral lymphoma, typically is around 63 to 64 years of age. And uh, these patients have certainly advanced disease in most of them, 85% of them. Now, when we look at patients who have been heavily pretreated here, at least 70, 69% of them have failed more than three lines of therapy. And a fifth of these cases have failed uh, autologous transplant. Now, the, the study had two populations, the large B-cell lymphoma, 
or a group that uh, involved primary mediastinal B cell lymphomas, or this group also have what we call transformed follicular lymphomas. Now for the medical student and the resident, transformed follicular lymphoma is not Richter transformation. Transformed follicular lymphoma is transformed lymphoma. Richter transformation is specifically cases of chronic lymphocytic leukemia that transform into a large cell component. So what we see here, and if I were to take you back to the previous slide, which shows 7 to 12% or so complete remission rate, here we start seeing 49% complete remission rates for the large visceral lymphoma group, 71%, again, numbers are very small here, but 71% uh, impressively, and overall for the entire population, 54% complete remission rates. So you can see that CAR T cell therapies have been able to improve remission rates by at least seven to tenfold versus what was available before that. Again, this is a comparison of two year outcomes of ZUMA1 versus SCHOLAR1. This is not randomized, this is just a historical control with two superimposed uh, survival curves here showing that uh, ZUMA1 or the CAR T had been able to reduce the risk of death by 73%, showing a median survival of 31 months versus only 5.4 months. So clearly impressive when you look at, at this particular product. And more impressive is the fact that this product is effective regardless of the presence of adverse prognostic features. We know that age, for instance, is an adverse prognostic in large cell lymphoma. And you can see that the responses were very comparable here. We know that the uh, IPI score is also important. The higher, the worse. You can see that the responses were comparable between the two groups. Disease bulkiness, uh, these products were effective regardless of the bulky of the disease. And also the cell of origin, typically with the activated B cell subtype, having a more aggressive course, although more recently we know that the double and triple hit lymphomas appear to be more commonly occurring with the germinal center B cell type. Again, no difference in terms of response. This data has been updated. So five years later, we can see survival rates of around 42.6% with certainly a plateauing of the survival curves. But more importantly, if you look at the cases who actually attain a complete remission, uh, early in the treatment phase, those patients, 64.4% of them were alive five years later. And this is something that I would like to emphasize. If I were to leave you with, with three main messages from this presentation, the first message is that the prognosis of large B-cell lymphoma when treated with CAR T-cell therapy is dictated in the first 90 days of the treatment. Those patients who achieve a complete remission, as shown in the green curve here, are the ones who are destined to do the best. The one on the orange curve here is those are the patients who achieve a partial response. Uh, typically, those will be the Duville scores of four uh, by, by PET scan assessment. And the point to make here is that partial response is not sufficient uh, when you treat patients with uh, CAR T cell therapy. You have to, those patients have to have earlier interventions and the, really the challenge is what to do with those cases. And I'm gonna try to share some, some strategies in, in the later part of my presentation. The second study known as Juliet uh, use, uh, evaluated this product called Tisagen Leclusel. Again, the same population. 111 patients, comparable median age. I would say the, the salient difference between this study and the previous one, the previous study, only 21% of the patient had failed a prior autotransplant. In this case, almost 50% of the cases have failed a prior autologous transplant. The same uh, outcomes in terms of uh, efficacy across all the different uh, prognostic subgroups. And when data was published uh, with a median follow-up of around 40 months, you can see that survival uh, are also showing a plateauing in the, in the curves uh, for both progression-free and overall survival. And this is the third study that, that was also approved for this particular indication. This study is a little bit more complicated in design known as Transcend NHL001. 344 patients intended and they did undergo leukophoresis. And you can see the various reasons why uh, this patient did not end up receiving the product, either because of disease-related complication, no longer meeting eligibility criteria, or withdrawing their consent or other reasons. Only 256 patients were included in the evalu uh, efficacy uh, evaluable set. Now, median age, I would say, uh, or actually 
42% uh, of the patients were older than 65 years, and 10% of the patients were older than 75 years of age. The large majority were large visceral lymphomas. They did allow, similar to the other studies, some transform as well as, as uh, other subtype of lymphomas. And you can see that a third of the patients have failed prior autologous transplantation. Again, the same message that we saw before with the, with the other products, survival is better for those patients to achieve a complete remission earlier in the disease course. You can see here by three months, the group of patients who had a stable disease, at, shown in the purple curve here, or the green showing the partial response, did not do as well as those patients to achieve a complete remission, and similarly for the progression-free survival. So it's very important that, that we follow these patients closely. In my clinic, I tend to do a PET scan on day plus 30 post CAR T cell therapy. If those patients are in complete remission, I will follow up with uh, CAT scans on day 90 onwards. If those patients are on partial response, I will repeat the PET scan on day 60 to make sure that these patients have, again, typically 10 to 15, maybe 20% would improve those responses. And by day 60, I start making a, a plan B of what to do for those cases. Now, our, our group is very interested in, in uh, prognostic factors. And one of them that we wanted to evaluate was hypoalbuminemia. And this was based on some of the data that has been reported by the group at Moffitt back in, uh, in 2014, led by Dr. Dahlia. And they show that, uh, as you may be aware, uh, hypoalbuminemia is an adverse prognostic in patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's less understood in the non-Hodgkin lymphoma group, but typically uh, thought to also carry an adverse prognosis. And in this particular case, patients with large visceral lymphoma in the rituximab era, the group at Moffitt were able to show that those patients with low albumin tend to have inferior survival. Here, the albumin cutoff was 3.7 or less compared to those patients who have a normal albumin level in this particular uh, case uh, shown in the orange curve. So we wanted to see whether the prognostic significance of hypoalbuminemia continues to retain uh, or, or uh, be present in the, in, in the setting of CAR T-cell therapy. So we look at the data from the three Mayo sites. This was a project led by, at that time, one of our internal medicine residents, Dr. Megan Melody, who is completing her fellowship at Northwestern in Chicago. And we could see that uh, hypoalbuminemia loses its prognostic significance in the setting of CAR T-cell therapy, no difference in terms of progression-free survival or in terms of overall survival. So we feel like these this, uh, treatments, CAR T-cell therapy, appear to be effective regardless of, of whatever adverse prognostic factors they may, they may be having. Again, another uh, important aspect that I'm going to briefly uh, present here to, to explain some of the subsequent slide is really the prognostic of what we know as double hit or triple hit lymphoma, and this really represents translocations between the MYC uh, gene and BCL2 and the BCL6. So MYC uh, can translocate with BCL2, or MYC can translocate with BCL6, or the three can be translocated in what's called as triple hit lymphomas. And we can see here from, from data that uh, patients who have double hit lymphomas tend to have inferior progression free survival after autologous transplantation, and those patients tend not to do that well after that, and very difficult to rescue them with subsequent therapies. Again, the blue curves representing the ones who do not have the double hit phenotype, and the yellow curves here showing the ones who have the double hit phenotype. And you can see that the difference was both in terms of overall survival as well as progression free survival. So what did we learn from uh, the American Society of Hematology a uh, few months ago in New Orleans is that uh, in this particular study, it's a, a multi-center analysis from various groups uh, led by Dr. Zurko and colleagues, uh, 536 patients, but only 408 uh, were included in the final analysis, 80 of them having a double hit phenotype and 328 having the non double hit phenotype. These are the reasons why some of the patients were excluded and uh, not unusually. In fact, we know that patients with double hit are more likely to have germinal center B cell origin, 87 versus 54%. They were more primary refractory or relapsed within 12 months from chemoimmunotherapy, 84 versus 71. 
and they were more likely to receive earlier the CAR T cell therapy, meaning in the second line, 10% versus none of the non double hit phenotype. And what you can see here is the response rate, median progression free survival, and median overall survival were comparable between the two groups, showing that CAR T cell therapy can overcome the prognostic significance of double hit lymphomas. There were some predictors for imperial progression free survival. Those were the patients who have more than two lines of therapy prior to the apheresis, the ones who receive bridging therapy, and the ones who have elevated LDH at apheresis. And again, those are probably more bridging therapy, meaning probably more aggressive disease. But here, when you look at the overall progression free survival, there was no difference between the double hit lymphomas with the median progression free survival of 7.5 months versus 6.2 months for those who do not have. Now let's move to the CAR T cell therapy in the second line. So obviously based on that success that was observed with the beyond second line or third, third line and beyond, then the idea was why not move it earlier in the treatment uh, course. And there were three randomized studies. Uh, one is known as ZUMA7. Uh, the second one was known as TRANSFORM. And the third one was Belinda study. The two of... Uh, studies ZUMA7 and TRANSFORM did demonstrate superiority of those CAR T products versus standard of care, whereas the third study failed to show an advantage. And again, just to explain here, standard of care is not really autologous transplantation. A standard of care is a package of chemoimmunotherapy with a platinum-based regimen to be followed by autologous transplant if those patients attain an objective response rate, meaning a partial response or a complete remission. So the first study, ZUMA1, uh, looked at axicaptagen cellulosal. This was the design of the study. Uh, primary endpoint was event-free survival, and this was assessed by a blinded central reviewer. A total of 359 cases from uh, 77 uh, clinical sites, adult patients, and these patients have either failed to respond to CHOP plus rituximab or relapsed within less than a year of that treatment. This patient must have been intended to proceed with an autologous transplant, one-to-one -one randomization. Those who respond will move to the transplant, and those who don't will be off study. This study did not allow for crossover. And here are some of the important aspects to, to really assess from this study. When you look at the population that was assigned the CAR-T arm, 180 patients, uh, were assigned, and 170 ended up receiving the product. So 94% of the cases who were intended to the CAR-T arm ended up receiving that particular product, whereas uh, out of the 179 patients who were assigned the standard of care arm, only 64 did. So you can see that 94% of the patients receiving the treatment versus only a third of the patient. And if you were to look at the reasons for that, mostly progressive disease, stable disease, progressive disease, at different stages of the, tree, of the treatment collection and so on and so forth. So these patients uh, have aggressive diseases and that's the beauty of CAR T cell therapy that it's able to uh, control the disease and you don't have to be in a objective response rate for them to be effective. If the patient has persistent disease, they will still be equally effective. So the primary endpoint was met. The axis cell arm was superior to the standard of care arm. Median progression, median event free survival was 8.3 months versus two months only. So a four fold or higher increase in event free survival. And when we look at the subgroup analysis, whether patients uh, based on age, based on uh, cell of origin type or uh, other criteria, there was not a single uh, criteria for which the standard of care was better. In fact, the CAR T arm axis cell was better in all aspects of, of this disease. The second positive study was the TRANSFORM study. This was again a randomized phrase T trial, very similar in design. I'm gonna be summarizing some of the difference between these studies in the subsequent slides. And you can see here that this particular study also met the endpoint with the median event free survival of 10.1 months versus 2.3 months for the standard of care arm, showing a strong statistical significance and a hazard ratio of 0 0.35. Again, similar to the previous study, uh, the ZUMA7, all uh, prognostic factors 
uh, or regardless of the prognostic factor, CAR T cell therapy was superior to the standard of care. So the third study was Belinda study, and I'm putting the three studies here side by side. And we can see here that, uh, for instance, in red, the patient who ended up receiving the standard of care arm, 36% versus 94% for the CAR-T, for transform 46 versus 97, and for Belinda, similarly, 32 versus 96. Until then, it looks like the studies were very similar. Progressive disease at the time of CAR-T cell therapy, 1% versus 26%. So what we see here also is that Zuma 7 did not allow for bridging therapy, and if needed, it was only steroids allowed. The other two studies did allow for that, and the patients who received the most salvage therapies or bridging therapies were actually the group in Belinda, leading to the fact that when you look at median time from leukopheresis to CAR-T infusion, 29 days from vein to vein, meaning from the collection to the infusion, transformed 31 days, but Belinda 54 days, almost twice the amount of time that, that it required for, for the Zuma 7 or the transform study. Again, this study did not allow crossover. These two did allow some crossover, but we don't feel that the crossover really affected in any way the, the overall outcome of the study. When you look at overall response rates, 83% for the CAR-T, 50% for the standard of care arm, 86 and 48, and here was 46 and 42 for the Belinda study. And when you look at the median event-free survival, 8.3 versus two months, 10 versus 2.3 months, and here was similar three and three months, respectively, for the CAR-T and the standard of care arm when using the tisagen leclucid as per the Belinda study. So this interesting analysis by uh, Pomier and colleagues from France they look as if they're comparing these studies side by side and showing that uh, in this reconstructed curve, axis cell versus lysocell, these are the two red curves here, showing that they are comparable p-value of 0.8, whereas axis cell, which is this red, versus tisagen uh, leclucid, which is this uh, darker color, showing superiority for the uh, axis cell and similarly for the lysocell. And you can see here on the right side of the slide that the control arms were comparable, no difference between them. So there was no effect of the control arm uh, in terms of the ultimate outcome of the study. Now, this study from CIBMTR, which I participated in, uh, it looks at really comparing CAR T cell versus autologous transplantation, and there are many caveats on this study that it's worth mentioning. One of them is that this is a registry study. So this is data reported from various transplant centers to the CIBMTR database. And we look at 145 CAR-T cases and 266 autotransplant cases. The first thing that comes to mind is that when you look at median lines of therapy, three for the CAR-T and two for the autotransplant, so they are not balanced or matched in that particular regard. Median age, very similar. There were not statistically different, although there was a trend suggesting that the patient on the CAR-T was slightly older in age by two years. When you look at progression-free survival here, autotransplant in partial response, and this is the emphasis here, they have to, have be, they have to be in partial response. There was a trend for superior outcomes in terms of progression-free survival, and in terms of a lower relapse in the red curve here, cumulative instance of relapse, favoring the autologous transplant compared to the CAR T cell therapy, ultimately resulting in a better survival for the autologous arm here. And, and this slide really is what I used to build my algorithm here at Mayo Clinic, which I'm going to share with you on the next slide, and, and perhaps giving it a chance for, for uh, autotransplant to continue to play some role in these cases, and I will try to explain why in the next slide. So at Mayo Clinic, if a patient has large visual lymphoma and gets treated with CHOP plus rituximab or equivalent, some, some of our groups like the EPOC, rituximab, and so on, if these patients are truly primary refractory cases, then this patient will go on the CAR T cell therapy with either axis cell based on Zuma 7 or lysocell based on the transform study. If these patients are responsive, but then later relapse, if the relapse occurs within or more than 12 months later, 
then this patient will get standard second line therapy. And if these cases are sensitive, they will go for an autologous transplant. If these patients are refractory to second line, then this patient will go to any of the CAR Ts. And for this particular indication, Tisagen Lucluse remains a viable option because this, the Juliet study showed that uh, uh, improved in survival. So it's approved for third line and beyond, but it's not approved for second line. And important to keep that point. Now, this is where it gets a little bit uh, complicated. For patients to relapse within 12 months, and this was the criteria for Zuma 7 and Transform, if those patients do relapse within 12 months, in, in our center, we tend to differentiate between those who happen soon after uh, the completion of therapy, let's say the first three to four months empirically, versus those who are closer to the 10, 11, and 12 months. So those who have a partial response, we still consider them for autologous transplant if they achieve a sensitive disease. And the reason for that is, is we know that there is data that CAR T cell therapy is effective despite failing an autologous transplant, but the opposite is not true. So we would like to, to continue to be able to offer that possibility for that group uh, in partial response based at least on the CIB MTR data. And for those in complete remission, the data is still being analyzed where that particular question is being asked of whether patient in CR, CAR T versus autotransplant. We don't have that analysis resulted yet, but that certainly should be coming uh, soon. So what are the toxicities associated with CAR T cell treatments? Uh, you may be familiar with cytokine release syndrome. It's a potentially serious complication. I would say nowadays we know how to diagnose it early. It's a cytokine-mediated inflammatory response due to, we think it's because of the CAR T activation and expansion, but also because of the recruitment of immune effector cells like macrophages that respond to the CAR T activation. This patient can have simply mild fevers uh, responding to Tylenol, or they can have severe hemodynamic compromise and sometimes organ failure. Median time to onset, according to the product, is different. The soonest appears to be happening with uh, axicaptogen cellulosal. The latest appears to be happening with lysocaptogen marulosal. So the products have different kinetics here. And rarely we have this syndrome that sometimes we struggle with called uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistiosis like I, I want to make that clear that it is not HLH, it's an HLH-like presentation. So uh, how do we grade uh, these cases? Uh, grade one is uh, patient to have uh, just simply fevers. Grade two is when the patient have fevers and may be requiring a couple of liters of oxygen by nasal cannula. When you start uh, increasing that uh, uh, oxygen requirements and patient requiring now more of like uh, non-rebreathers or so on, then that moves them to grade three, or if they start requiring pressure support. And grade four are those patients who are on multiple pressors. By that time, either they are on the ICU with uh, on mechanical ventilation or so on and so forth. Now, if I were to leave you with, with the second important message from this presentation is that even though you may be 100% certain that these patients uh, fever is chronologically related to the product, you always have to rule out the possibility of infections as a cause of the fever, simply because the patient had been so heavily pretreated. We have had found, uh, we have found few cases where fungal infections or other infections sometimes that, that show up with this fever, which we, we were sure that was supposed to be cytokine release syndrome. Neurotoxicity is another uh, interesting toxicity that happens with this product. Depends a lot on the product that is used with the higher incidence with AxiCell. And we know that certain criteria uh, are associated with this, including the high tumor burden, the high peak of CAR T cell expansion, if the patients have pre existing uh, neurological comorbidities, or if the disease burden in the bone marrow uh, is higher, as is the case for, for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or if patients who have severe cytokine release syndrome tend to have more uh, higher risk of developing neurotoxicity. It typically presents as a toxic encephalopathy. Sometimes it's just a transient confusion that resolves. Sometimes it lasts several days. Typically it's reversible. We have had uh, in clinical, some of the clinical studies have had uh, some cases of developing cerebral edema and dying from that. Uh, and it tends to have a biphasic presentation. 
Uh, the phase one, as described here, I sometimes don't believe it, honestly, because uh, those patients are having high fevers. They are a little bit obtunded or lethargic, and I don't know if that's because of the fever. As soon as the fever resolves, the neurological toxicity seems to get better. Uh, many times it's more easy to discern. But then we have this phase two, which happens after five day five, which by then the CRS have subsided. And uh, sometimes we see this happening later with certain CAR-T than, than with others. So we use this scoring system uh, based on the American Society of Transplantation called the Immune Effector Cell Associated Encephalopathy Score. And what it is basically patients are asked two uh, questions. Uh, do they know where they are in terms of uh, location, time uh, of the year, uh, month, and so on and so forth? Can they name three objects in the room? Uh, can they follow commands? Are they able to write a sentence? And we can look at the handwriting to, to assess if, if neurotoxicity is starting to happen. And we also at, look at the attention uh, of this patient. Uh, ability to count backwards from 100 to 10 is one of the strategies that, that I've suggested. And based on uh, the score, if the patient had any of those abnormal, then that will be grade one, meaning a score will be seven to nine. A normal score is 10. And you can see here that the, high, the lower the score, the more uh, serious the neurological toxicity is. So what had been the strategies to, to circumvent or mitigate that toxicity, uh, particularly with this product, Axicel, the company, manufacturing company, designed a study to look into prophylaxis uh, using prophylactic steroids and what, what is uh, uh, known as the, uh, the cohort six of this study. And what they did is they got a cohort of around 40 patients and they basically prescribe this patient uh, steroids, typically dexamethasone, 10 milligrams on day zero before the infusion, day one and day two. Now, the reason why this was done in a separate cohort is the thought that could the steroids affect the efficacy of the product because of the lympholytic effect of steroids on, on the lymphocyte. And what was found was really interesting. This is cohorts one and two which is the normal cohort of the study versus cohort six. These were not matched. And then they matched them with using propensity scores. And then they saw that uh, the cumulative area under the curve or cumulative corti cortisone equivalent uh, dose was sixfold higher in the patient who did not receive prophylaxis compared to those who did receive prophylaxis. So you are able to lower the, the severity perhaps of cytokine release syndrome and hence use less amount of steroid without affecting any of the uh, efficacy of these products you can see objective responses of 95 percent versus 83 percent so not statistically different here and the same was for progression free survival and overall survival again when you look at toxicities uh, much uh, lower incidence of severe grade three or higher toxicities, 12% versus none for the prophylactic cohort here. And when you look at neurotoxicities here, the median time to onset appears to have been pushed away by at least five or six days or so. So without having a, a much higher incidence of or significant difference in, in the incidence of, of infection. So this strategy appears to be working and we use it in our center for those patients who have certain neurological conditions before the procedure or those patients who uh, we feel could be more frail uh, and, and uh, we use that strategy. Now, the other aspect that, that really has uh, been uh, kind of surprising is that some of these toxicities appear to be inherent to the person itself based on the presence of certain germline variants, like in this case, the STX-BP2. And those patients who, who harbor this particular uh, variant appear to be at higher risk of developing serious toxicity. So the, this is a study by Lake and colleagues uh, where they look into uh, this case control of patients who have severe cytokine release syndrome, severe uh, neurotoxicity, a grade three or higher, and who had received treatment with this IL-6 inhibitor known as tocilizumab. And this really defined the toxicity cohort of this patient. And uh, comparing to a control cohort, they look at 17 HLA-associated genes 
And what they found is really enrichment of this particular one in toxicity cases relative to control patients. These three were notoriously known uh, uh, in primary HLH. And what was interesting is that patients harboring this variant had toxicity after axicel and much higher levels of baseline interferon and inflammatory cytokines compared to those who did not have toxicity. So clearly it's more complicated than just simply the product. The host itself can actually play an important role. Again, uh, importantly to keep in mind, and at our center, we have taken this approach of patients who develop severe neurotoxicity requiring chronic steroids. We start checking uh, a week later or so CD4 counts, we lost one patient because of fatal mycobacterium abscessus. This is something that is more common in patients who undergo lung transplantation or, or solid organ transplant uh, due to the more profound immunosuppression. And in this particular case, this was a patient that had developed so much neurotoxicity would not stop having seizures unless the patient was on high dose of steroids and anti-seizure medications, obviously, and, and uh, eventually developed this uh, fatal mycobacterium. The other aspect of, of, uh, of uh, where the field is going is in terms of uh, looking at these uh, hematotoxicities. And then this interesting study from uh, Dr. Ejenski at colleagues, this is multi-center international, looking at uh, this hematotox score. And I'm gonna try to, to walk you here through this. So uh, there are some baseline features like platelet count, ANC, absolute neutrophil count, the hemoglobin and the C-reactive protein and the ferritin, which are, inflammatory. So the patient could either have all of these results and have a zero point, or they could have one or two points here. The higher score is considered two or higher, and the lower score is zero or one. And you can see here that uh, there is a trend for a worse survival for the patient with the high CAR hematotox, and uh, certainly uh, inferior progression-free survival uh, for that group itself. In terms of hematotoxicity, much higher for the high CAR hematotox, and those patients who have uh, a higher score tend to have higher incidence of severe neutropenia as well. So the part of the uh, treatment that uh, certainly is more challenging is uh, what to do with those patients who fail CAR T therapy. Prognosis is dismal. I think the, most of the series show a median survival that is between 5.2 months to 6.4 months. This is data from, from the group at Stanford uh, and uh, compar comparing uh, or combining their, their data with, with uh, many other centers in the United States, showing that the median survival is around 180 days. Now, uh, what, what is one of the uh, particular uh, challenges here? These CAR T products that are approved for lymphomas target CD19. So you can see here uh, antigen modulation or loss of the CD19 resulting in a relapsed disease with a CD19 negative phenotype occurring somewhere between nine and up to 58% of the cases who have a disease relapse. And this is one of the examples uh, of a patient who had CD19 positive disease. You can see here on the PET scans, the abundance of the disease one month later, a partial response. And they, remember, PR is not sufficient for these cases. By the third month, already had progressive disease and the phenotype became CD19 negative. So unfortunately, not a lot of good options there. I'm gonna share some of the data that we have participated in. And if, if, if the patients are fit, young, and uh, able to, to really move forward and have a suitable donor in hand, then allogeneic transplant is one of the possibilities. We look at that uh, in, in 88 patients from 18 US centers. We did contribute around six, uh, seven of those patients from our center. Median age of 54, the oldest was 72, mostly male patients. And we can see that uh, the most important determinants were actually complete remission. If those patients go to the allogeneic transplant in complete remission, they are the ones who are destined to do the best. Those who are on partial response still have a hazard ratio of 4.3, so much, much worse uh, survival compared to those who are in complete remission. And interestingly, also the patients uh, who were other than white patients, Hispanics or others, uh, or the Hispanic group did not do as well as, as the, the other ones. This was uh, the case also for the CR for progression-free survival and also for uh, 
towards non-relapse mortality as well. So allogeneic transplant, if a patient goes into a complete remission, is worth a trial. And then Dr. Iqbal from our center, uh, we put a multi-center uh, data set uh, from uh, several centers in the country, including the Moffitt Cancer Center and other Mayo, website, Mayo sites, and also uh, uh, other uh, centers nationwide. And uh, we look at really uh, patients uh, on this observational study who really get treated with uh, after CAR T cell therapy, we were looking specifically at CD19 directed therapies to see if there is still hope there. Uh, either they were treated with tafacitamab plus lenalidomide or the long uh, and those were really treatment at any point post CAR T failure. We were able to put together 41 patients, median age was 30, uh, 65 years of age, 60% uh, of them were male, and uh, the 41% were actually refractory to the CAR T, 68% of them received the Tafalen combination, and 32% of them received the Lonca uh, product. And you can see here, and I'm going to draw your attention, that these uh, survival curves are weeks and not months. So uh, median overall survival for these cases, 18 weeks. So a little over four months. Median progression free survival, only eight weeks. So we really don't think that these, these are products that will give you, unless you have somebody who is ready to move to a transplant and they do achieve a CR to this product, then, then probably this is not a good option to bet on for a, longer, for a longer durability. Uh, causes of death, progressive disease, 75% of the cases, infection 21, and secondary malignancies, four of the cases. So this is my last slide. I know that this was a lot of information, uh, but would like to say that CAR T has revolutionized the treatment of large B-cell lymphomas. They are here to stay in the relapsed refractory setting uh, beyond second line. We know that the one-year survival for those cases was less than 15%. Now we are seeing five-year survival of around 40%. We know that these products are also indicated in the second line based on Zuma 7 and Transform. I would say that uh, autotransplant still continues to play a role in the partial response, especially those who uh, relapsed on the later part of those 12 months. What about complete remission? I mentioned that that study is still ongoing with the CIBMTR. We know that toxicities are very unique, cytokine release syndrome and uh, the neurotoxicities, but certainly manageable. Uh, for cytokine release syndrome, typically it's the uh, tocilizumab is the, the drug of choice uh, if they have failed supportive therapies and, and uh, antipyretics. For ICANS is typically steroids. I share with you some of the data on the germline variant STX BP2 and the data on the HECAR hematotox score. And certainly uh, continue to be a challenge uh, for CAR T cell therapy uh, failures, uh, median survival of approximately six months. I would say efficacy of allotransplant is promising, but the patients have to be in complete remission prior to embarking in that procedure. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, again, thank you for uh, honoring me to present uh, this important uh, medical grand round. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll take your privilege and then turn it over to Dr. Ajazi. I, I just, uh, it's really stunning to see the advancement of science and uh, a completely different approach uh, with this chimeric approach. I, my the obvious question is I'm you know going into Google trying to figure out uh, how can we get this to the people who need it uh, just because I figure something this new and this uh, the technology is is so uh, fascinating that there's going to be a price and the price that I came up with please correct me if I'm wrong but it was saying four hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars is that really a accurate and b are there programs so that people who have our, our healthcare economic and socioeconomic disparities can have this available yes yeah, so the product is uh, interestingly when they were originally approved it was 379000 and uh, one of the products came later with a higher tag price and the other two companies raised the prices so they went on 379 to like 450 now, the part uh, that is important is that uh, that is only the, the 
parts without the labor. So that's really mm -hmm. the cost of procurement of the product. So this is what, what you need to pay to procure the product before you can infuse the product to the patient. Uh, if you were to add, now we have gotten certainly much better with these prophylactic strategies and so on, but but probably when you start adding the cost of hospitalization and so on and so forth, there are some estimates for the first uh, 30 days that go somewhere between 675,000 to up to almost a million dollars of, of the part and the labor combined here. So, so it is it is certainly uh, a challenge. Uh, I would say that uh, when it comes to private insurance payers, uh, it is not a very profitable uh, from that particular standpoint. But you certainly can sustain uh, operations. When it comes to the more uh, traditional insurance for that particular age group, like Medicare or Medicaid, that is when the challenge is. So you need to, again, I have seen so many models from different institutions, but it seems that the three to one or two to one to be able to sustain. So you, for every two or three privates you do, you can afford to do one and still break even on all of them. Uh, it is a challenge. It is a challenge and uh, it is certainly something where where we as a transplant CAR-T community physicians have to really be stronger advocates to really make sure that this becomes a more affordable for the patient. And, and now that certainly there is more than one product, we were hoping that competition will bring the prices down. In fact, it brought them up and not down, which is, which is sad. Well, thank you for your advocacy in this area. It's so important. Uh, we really don't want to have buy or die policies when it comes to people who are economically deprived. Uh, yeah. Dr. Hadassi, um, take over. I, I just wanted to uh, point to another area that is seems to be developing in the field of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And I wonder if there is any data on outcomes with uh, bispecific antibodies and the T cell engagers in, in general. Are we seeing issues with the T cell exhaustion or having to depend on uh, the patient's own T cells to uh, succeed after um, CAR T cell therapy when we now are having all these off the shelf uh, T cell engagers that are going to be approved very soon? Yeah. So the data that exists out there, Dr. Higazi, is mostly data with uh, the T cell engager by specific after CAR T cell. And the data is not very abundant, actually. Uh, there are probably less than 15% of the patient in any particular series that, that have failed CAR T cell therapy and have responded to, to T cell engagers. Uh, when you look specifically at that, the follow up is extremely short. Now, I show you the data here with the CD19 uh, antibodies, and, and uh, you do get some responses, but I, do, I remains to be seen how uh, those responses, how durable they can be. So I would say that uh, at least my personal experience has been one case on a clinical trial where the engager was able to get them into a complete remission and this patient was taken to a transplant, but that's an N of one. Now, what we don't know yet is because we don't have the other scenario that much abundant where patients have failed like engager and probably that data is out there but hasn't been analyzed until the studies were published and, and what is the success of CAR T cell therapy afterwards. Again, the engagers are, are all of the shelf products so you are not really using the, the but you are certainly getting that T cell to try to come and, and help that engager. Do, are they going to have more exhaustion? Uh, the answer is we don't know yet, in my opinion. But we know that certain chemotherapies do exhaust the cells more than others. For instance, there is not a single study out there that have not shown that bendamustine is not the right drug to give before you try to collect those cells for manufacturing. But theoretically, can the engagers affect the exhaustion? I, I don't know the answer to that. Right. And um, uh, to to echo uh, Dr. Williams, uh, I have to say that we are working our best to get those in terms of the CAR T cell therapy be available for 
um, the population that we serve here in Louisville, Kentucky and the surrounding area by the use of uh, research and clinical trials rather than the commercial use because of the high cost. Yeah. Uh, we have our GMP facility led with Dr. Emmons as well as Dr. Yassin and Dr. Chow working on um, pharmaceutical uh, clinical trials to bring in. And it's maybe another way of still being able to provide the um, therapy despite um, its high cost and not being able to have the ratio that you mentioned between uh, commercial insurance and Medicare, Medicaid. Um, and with, that in, with that in mind, do you uh, maybe want to just mention the evolution of this field towards allocar T and eventually agnostic CAR T without uh, MHC and T cell receptors that will become off the shelf therapy and change the economic dynamics of this in the future? Do you have a point of view on that? Certainly, that's that's a wonderful question. And, and I think that that so far, at least with the CAR T product that we have seen, uh, I can share some data on, on the study that was presented at ASH, the, what they called CRISPR. And uh, that company had an allocarty. Uh, unfortunately, by six months, uh, when you, they look at the responses at three months and then they look at subsequent duration of responses, uh, at three months, uh, there were significant responses, uh, but more than half of the patient lost those responses by six months. So it is not really the, the challenge of, of the allogeneic CAR-T, in my opinion, the concern of graft versus host disease was something that there was it was worrying to the to the community but i think the 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 challenge became more into the host versus graft effect here the cells are not durable the car T's fade away quickly and uh, and the responses are not durable unfortunately and this is at least i can quote the data on two companies that have reported those type of outcomes. So you see that initial response, but you're not really sustaining them. Whereas you can see with the autologous one, they are lasting for many, many years. So could that bring the cost down? Of course. I, and that that would be the, the desirable approach to have them, number one, in that particular study, the median time from enrollment into study to infusing the CAR-T was only three days because they are already there present in your institution. Manufacturing your own CAR-T is not an impossible task, and the group at Wisconsin have done it. Uh, Dr. Niraf Shah has presented his data with the dual CD19, CD20, and, and it appears to be very promising. Again, can you manufacture at a large scale to be able to, to meet the needs of the state? That's a challenge. Uh, but I think that some costs, uh, uh, institutional costs, uh, again, these are all gross estimate, but talking to colleagues who are actually manufacturing their own CAR-T and including ours. If you were to manufacture your own CAR-T, probably the cost range somewhere I have, at least I have heard from, from colleagues, uh, is somewhere between 45000 to like $90,000, much cheaper than the 450 plus thousand dollars, obviously. But so you can really, it's a, it's, a, it's a good cost containment strategy. But the challenge would be, can you manufacture at that large scale that is the, the challenge and obviously the quality control and so on and so forth. One last question before we finish. Can you comment on the place of allogeneic transplant or do you see this as a multimodality CAR-T and how many different epitopes do you think CAR-T is going to need to target in the future to mimic the effect of allotransplant? You know, we have some uh, uh, CAR-Ts that have uh, tried to target more than, than one uh, particular target. And, and I can tell you that, again, this is very preliminary, uh, mouse models. Uh, it does not necessarily mean that you can improve the efficacy of this. Of this. At least in our hands, we have not seen that a multi-targeted CAR-T had been able to be superior to a one-target CAR-T so far. We are interested in a CAR-T that targets something called BAFFR, and that's going to be our target. And this is a ubiquitously expressed uh, B cell in B cells. And uh, in fact, we feel that that one of the areas where this could have a role is actually in autoimmune diseases like uh, systemic lupus and so on and so forth, in addition to B cell malignancies. Now, the question is a difficult question because uh, in theory, you would say that 
allo is more of a non-specific allo reactivity there with the graft versus malignancy effect. So intuitively, you will think that more targets are better, but in practice, it's not has not been as easy uh, to to do that. And and uh, we feel like like the, is the field going to be? And we're discussing that internally whether doing multi-target in sequence and not really loading a CAR T with a multi-target, but having sequential approaches to this is probably the way we think could could be better. But I I cannot give you a number of how many epitopes or so on. I, I don't know the answer to that. Thank you. All right, everyone. Um, I know we're about uh, five minutes past nine, so I think we're they'll probably wrap us up for today. Uh, Dr. Dabaja, thank you for an outstanding uh, outstanding talk, and uh, Dr. Hijazi, thank you for uh, thank you for um, facilitating another uh, this outstanding talk. We really do appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you again uh, Dr. for the invitation. Yeah, and before you go, uh, Dr. Dabaja, a um, couple of things. Number one, we have a tradition with the University of Louisville Department of Medicine for our guest speakers, and especially for our endowed chairs, uh, or endowed talks. Uh, we have a special gift for you. We'll have a special, we have a special gift for you that is very synonymous with the city of Louisville, and you will be getting your very own uh, engraved Louisville Slugger baseball bat. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very, very so, much. I'll be in touch with you in a, in a little bit about uh, where to ship it to and such. And uh, and if you and one more thing, if you could hang around for just a couple of more minutes, uh, we're going to do a thing called the Cardinal Minute. Sure. And what it, what it is, I know, uh, is something actually Dr. Williams uh, usually would uh, would would work with, but he had a meeting at at nine a.m. sharp that he could that he couldn't get away from. Um, it's basically just a, a basically we'll just do like a kind of a minute to a minute and a half two minutes with just summation kind of the take home you know kind of hit the take home points for your uh of your talk it's it was just a little video clip and we'll use it we uh, like to we'll have it on our website and on our uh, social media and uh, uh try to let people you know let people know more about what your the work you're doing so sure. um so I want to thank everyone that joined us this morning we'll be back next week at 8 a.m uh, next Thursday um and um, what I'm going to have ask you guys to do, I'm going to I'm going to end this meeting. I'm going to uh, I'm going to close this meeting. And then if you guys can just come back at the same using the same link. So just be us three and we'll we'll uh, take care of that. Take care of the Cardinal Minute and uh, we'll be you got everybody can be on their way. Sure. All right. So. <laughs>